A very good day to you and welcome to the Election Watch program proudly brought to you by the Civio Institute. The Election Watch program is all about discussing election, looking at the challenges and also the issues around the August 2023 elections with young people, women, experts and so much more. Today we're going to be looking at participation of women in elections, looking at the voters, the contestants, and asking the key question, what can we do? Women and the girl child constitute or make up 51% of the population, but there are very few women contesting or participating in uh, politics. And here I have experts with me who are going to be taking us through the challenges and the possible opportunities. Uh, to join me for this conversation, I have with me Sakile Sifelani, who is from the Women in Politics Support Unit. I have Grace Chirenje, who is a gender equality and social inclusion consultant. And lastly, I have Constance Maseko, who's from the Youth Empowerment and Transformation Trust, to tell us a little bit more about these challenges. Welcome, ladies. How are you? Fantastic. So I'll, I'll start off with Sakile. Let's talk about opportunities for women's participation in politics. Is this a sort of a, an illusion or are there opportunities for women in politics? I think actually it's, it's an opportunity for the country. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm going to start it. I think we've all seen the devastating numbers. Essentially, this election has been a bloodbath in terms of the numbers of, of, of women of women in participating in our politics, particularly for contested positions. And I think that's a good start. You know, we have a good start because I think for the past 10 years or so, we've been, you know, masquerading under the illusion that, you know, uh, they, uh, there is equal opportunity for women to participate in politics and that, you know, these opportunities are equitab equitably distributed and are equitably accessible. And so now we have an opportunity to have a national conversation, not right. to have a women's conversation, to have a national conversation about Zimbabwe wants to progress. It's over 40 years since independence. We can't regress the way that we are regressing. And clearly, whatever we have been doing is not working. So that's the opportunity for me. Secondly, I think it's a com it's an opportunity for us to say, you know, to our policymakers, put your money, you know, where your mouth is. Mm -hmm. I think we have been talking a little bit a, a lot about women should do this so and so should do this but this is an issue about our electoral framework and it's an issue about the law and it's an issue about are you actually willing to do the things you say you are you know you you you, you say you want to support women yeah. let's, let's let's get some action on the table so for me it's a it's a moment for us to actually galvanize some action around women's participation in a very strong way mm, thanks a lot sakile and talking about hindrance of women participating in politics constance you're a young woman let's talk about some of the restrictions uh, that hinder women from actively participating in politics okay so um, I would say there are no actually restrictions or laws against women participating in electoral processes. Mm -hmm. Participating in electoral processes, it's a constitutional right for all. But then there are challenges that uh, then limit women participation in electoral processes. Like uh, Saki mentioned, as it stands for the 2023 harmonious elections, we only have one female candidate, President yeah. Fela Rio, right, mm -hmm. for the presidential mm -hmm. position. Mm -hmm. uh, that is because of um, financial challenges that women face, right? Um, we, we had the nomination fees that are so high, even the young people tried to contest against those. But then that also uh, limits women's participation in electoral processes. And also the narrative that um, women, that, that is created by the patriarchal system, that women um, uh, are not for the, for the leadership positions, right? I really don't, uh, I really fail to understand where that comes from. Mm -hmm. Because as the women, we give birth to these men, right? And we nature them, we groom them until they are well up groomed people who can lead, right? But again, the grooming comes from the women. And women are then have the potential to lead, but then the patriarchal system has failed to accommodate or appreciate the skills of women in as much as leadership is concerned. Mm, that's very true. And talking about some uh, women-friendly spaces, Grace, uh, what are the stereotypes around mm. women, especially in politics? Um, do they talk about women's rights and issues, or are there opportunities for women to become decision makers? Mm. What do we see there? Is this uh, Are these cultural issues, for example, or stereotypes stopping women from actually participating? That's a very good question, Unique. Let me start by telling you a story. So there's a huge program that's being done by the Women's Coalition, Zimbabwe Gender Commission, and um, the UN Women. It's called Women Rise in Politics. And I've had the opportunity to work with the women politicians 
uh, that are aspiring to be candidates and some that are already contesting. And what the two sisters are talking about, Constance and Saki, in terms of stereotypes is actually true. Mm -hmm. So during this program and all over, the, all over the country, it doesn't matter which province, consistently, women are saying that they are so afraid to participate because they're either being called hure, right? They're either, uh, their children as they walk down the street are being tagged as manawe hure, right? And there are also issues to do with um, uh, how do you contest for political office if you're single, you don't have a husband. So who are you in society? You know. So when you hear those stories, you're shocked because this is 2023. We're not supposed to have conversations around such petty stereotypes. It's not about uh, the gender of somebody that wants to represent um, a constituency, but it's about the effectiveness of the candidate. But nobody's talking about that. Everybody's concerned about who the woman is sleeping with, uh, whether she's married, who her children are, where does she come from. And I think it doesn't help us at all as a country. It does not even help the women. So when we talk of safe spaces, we'll also look at the political parties. Every person, every political party is aware that women need to participate. I have worked with political parties across the board, by the way, and they know this. But the question is, is there political will and commitment from the so-called leadership to ensure that women are coming to the table mm -hmm. as equals. And are the power dynamics that are being presented within the political parties uh, being shared equally amongst the, the men and the women? And the answer is no. We do know that, I know there's a political party and I will not mention the name. They do say that when the women are contesting, the political party is aware of where the women are going to lose or where the party is going to lose. And what, once they know that, guess who's going to be put at the forefront? It's the woman. So I don't think I don't think they really care about women's participation. Mm -hmm. I think it's something that is sexy to talk about. And so everybody wants to look like, oh, God, you know what? We want to be inclusive, so let's talk about women. If people were really serious about inclusivity and getting rid of those stereotypes, would not have, a, would not have this 11% and just one woman president. I don't think it makes sense. So, yeah, those stereotypes are real, mm -hmm. and we need to do something urgently about it. Saki, 40 years on um, independence, uh, we are still seeing that we have uh, our patriarchal society obviously dominating within the political spaces. And just going back to what Grace was saying, that if a woman is uh, um, going to contest, she's called a prostitute, why is she single? Her children or her family are also being discriminated. Why do you think we haven't learned any lessons? I mean, it's been 40 years. Because we have allowed ourselves to pay attention to nonsense conversations. Mm. Uh, that's the short answer. But the long answer is, you know, I think it's important to highlight that in 2023, the issue around women's participation is regressing. It's not just continuing to be low. You know, we're actually going backwards. So if you look at the trends in the country, for example, 10 years ago, we had the three major political parties out of the three major political parties that were participating at that time in our governance space. You know, two of them had vice presidents who were women based on their own party systems and their own party regulations. We are now in an environment where political parties, you know, don't even have vice presidents that are women. I know that the ruling party, you know, will, will explain that their presidium includes the national chairman and therefore the post that the uh, current national chairperson of the ZANU-PF is holding is equ equ equitable to the presidium. But I mean, you know, for me, it's we had vice presidents. You know, we were actually moving. We were being counted. You know, Malawi had a, a president and we were like, we must be next because yeah. we've got a vice president. Exactly. And all of the other political parties also have vice presidents. You know, we started doing things differently. Ten years ago, we started having women being uh, spokespersons. We started having women becoming treasurer generals of political parties. We were moving progressively. We were doing things we had never done before. Mm -hmm. And we were doing it because there was role modeling. We were doing it because we believe that capacity ma mattered and that we, it did not demerit. Being a woman did not demerit you. Mm -hmm. But now somehow it seems like being a woman on its own is a demerit. Mm -hmm. And so I get very upset when we hear these conversations that say women are wanting to be given, you know, special privileges. Women are wanting to be, you know, women don't qualify based on merit. But do we need, what does affirmative action look like? And I'm saying we now have a society that actively militates against women's participation. Right? And, and we do that because we are saying that these thoughts, these stereotypes, these negative social norms 
actually have value. Mm -hmm. We need to stop accepting social norms that bring about a devaluation. I like to give the example of when I was growing up and something totally different from politics. When I was growing up, uh, you know, it was known if you raped somebody seven years, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but now there are children who are being raped and there doesn't seem to be some kind of framework that is adhered to that actually delivers on standardization of certain crimes, particularly when it comes to women. Yeah. Of course, you know, uh, women are not as important as, you know, uh, aluminium piping and uh, livestock because those ones have mandatory sentences. I know that as that parliament was winding up, we've got now mandatory sentences for aggravated circumstances in a rape or sexual offenses. But my point is the principle is changing. Mm -hmm. And it's changing because we are allowing ourselves to say that one person's opinion matters more than the rights that we are trying to deliver. We want to deliver on rights. And I think these are not rights that have been imported. These are rights that we as Zimbabweans believe in. These are rights that we have said, this is what we want. And we did that even before the constitution was there. So why are we going backwards? Let's try and begin to do practices, norms, and laws that take us forward. Mm. Well, after a short break, we'll continue this conversation, this heated conversation, <laughs> as of course, um, you know, we've sort of captured that women's participation in politics is regressing. But we're also going to be asking a key question. Is the quota system enough to ensure women's participation in the electoral process? We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Election Watch program proudly brought to you by the Civio Institute, where today we're going to be talking about, or we were actually talking about women in elections, talking about them being voters, uh, contestants, and what can we do? What are the challenges there and what are the opportunities? And of course, on our panel, I have with me Sakile uh, Sifilani, who's from the Women in Politics Support Unit. I have Grace Chirenji, who is a gender equality and social inclusion consultant, and last I have Constance Maseko, who's from the Youth Empowerment and Transformation Trust. And just before the break, we were trying to create a sort of a foundation looking at where we're coming from and where we're going and looking into the challenges. But right now, let's focus a little bit on the quota system. And I'll start with Sakile. Ensuring women's participation in the electoral process is when we look at the quota system. And we had a few young people talking about, you know, women's representation not being enough within the parliament, obviously. What more do you think can be done? Is it enough? I, I, I think I want to start by uh, prefacing my remarks by saying I think it's important to appreciate where quotas come from. Right. Right. Quotas come from a, from a need. And when you have a system that's rigid and is not absorbing inclusion within its basic system, you create a foundation for the call for quotas. Mm -hmm. So let's understand that Zimbabwe wasn't doing what it what the women in the country wanted it to do. Zimbabwe was not delivering 50-50. And so the, the concept of quotas was to try and help the social norms of the country begin to be more embracing of inclusion and diversity by introducing quotas. But it, the dream is not to have a country that is embedded in quotas. Mm -hmm. The dream is to walk away from quotas. So, you know, you'll find that in, in legal spaces, people will say quotas are temp special temporary measures. Right. Right. And if you look at what we did in as a country, when we put in the quota system, when it started, it was, you know, the 60 seats and it was 10 years because the idea is that it's a special temporary measure. You are supposed to take it as a progressive step to going to full 50 50. But if you look at the conversations we're having in the run up to the 2023 election, we have now had conversations that have fixated on quotas. Now it looks like women can't participate unless they are in a quota. Mm -hmm. And so. This begins to explain why we'll see that the women's movement in this country is continuously saying 50-50. The concept of 50-50 is to say we want an electoral system that talks about the 210 seats. We don't want an electoral system that talks about come chiripa side. We don't want to have a side conversation. Let's look at our electoral system, all of it. Let's see to what extent it, in, it in, 
it absorbs diversity. Yeah. It absorbs, you know, I mean, currently we're talking only about, let's say, you know, women, youth, and persons with disability. Are we talking about ethnic inclusion? Mm -hmm. You know, I, someone could do an ethnic analysis and say, you know, our governance architecture doesn't have enough inclusion based on ethnicity. Mm -hmm. Somebody could look at it from a different perspective. Maybe I haven't even done the analysis. I'm sure we could do an analysis on, is it inclusive enough of the diverse economic strata that we have in our society maybe it is not we can't send everything to quotas we need to be able to talk about how do we make sure that our electoral system whether we use first past the post or whether we use proportional representation how do we make sure that our governance representatives look like the rest of our society mm -hmm. that you can look at your parliament you can look at your local authority and be like yeah there's somebody who looks like me there who understands where i come from and can represent me adequately Hmm. And uh, I mean, obviously, uh, Saki is giving a lot of relevant points, uh, looking back into the community and seeing what it looks like instead of just fol following the politics mm -hmm. of the day. Um, let's talk a little bit about encouraging women's participation in elections. It seems women have obviously taken a back seat as well. And because of the different barriers and challenges, how can we um, sort of help propel women's participation in politics, what sort of conversations should we be having with them? Or what sort of conversations should we be having with policymakers? Mm. All right. So I don't think women have taken a back seat when it comes to participating in politics, in participating in anything, mm -hmm. especially politics. Mm -hmm. I think women are ready to lead. I like what Constance said. We gave birth to this world. I mean, how are we just taking a big seat and say we are sort of, it's almost like mixing the dough and then you leave the bread to just miraculously, you know, happen. I think women are very active when it comes to leadership, really. I always say that if we can lead our homes, we can lead anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't think the conversation, like I said earlier on, I don't think the conversation is about um, women are not leading. The conversation is about how do we create uh, systems that facilitate for women to lead in a safe way. Mm -hmm. I think Saki gave an example of rape. Uh, the objectification of women is so rife within uh, Party, parties and political spaces. So I think some of the conversations we need to have is to, to say, how are we including women fully? How are we making sure that the laws... So, for example, let's say 50-50. The Constitution is so clear. Mm -hmm. We will not even get into that. So what is going on, really, with the policymakers? Because I think there needs to be a way to say... Uh, it's punitive for you not to actually have 50-50. Mm -hmm. And let's not just have people as a rubber stamping process or a box seeking exercise. Yeah. We need women to participate fully. I think I also spoke about power earlier on. It's not just how many are we? One, two, three, four. Okay, there are two women, two men, and, we'll, and we've done it. What are the women doing when we come around the table? Right? Are they give are they being given a safe space to speak up? Mm -hmm. Right? And it's not just women at a very high level, the next at national level. We've got so many spaces women are leading at. So how can we facilitate for the women to show up fully and begin to have conversations that are meaningful that are meaning meaningful to them and to the rest of community? Mm -hmm. And lot, let's not forget that it's not just about a, a certain type of a woman. It's for all the women, women with disabilities, the black woman. And I think Zimbabwe needs to also be very careful about the race question because it's everybody. It's yeah. not just black women in Zimbabwe. It's all the women we can find in Zimbabwe. It's ensuring that uh, when we talk to policymakers, we're not just uh, massaging their egos. We're ensuring that women are participating and participating fully and holistically. Mm. Talking about women not being a homogeneous group, uh, Constance, um, how do issues of age, um, income, education, location, when we're looking at rural versus urban, affect women's participation, especially um, in the electoral or political processes? Okay. Um, so the challenge we have as a country is we have an education system that is especially at high, at high, primary and high, um, primary and high level that uh, fails to produce young people who are eager or have the energy to participate in civic and in electoral processes. Yeah. Right. So in that regard, you realize that um, a young person then, uh, f and a young woman, throws a double challenge of being mm. a young person and also of being a young woman, right? Mm. So in terms of um, age, right, you, you realize that as a young woman, you live in a family, and you may need um, a family support to participate in electoral processes. And if they are not so keen with you participating, then that also hinders you in, in 
appreciating your full potential as a young woman. Um, also, as um, in terms of age, again, there are issues of finances, right? Um, to support or to financially support your your political career as a young woman. And um, in terms of um, mm. rural young women, mm. um, they face the challenge of, uh, especially in rural communities, there are challenges of high stereotype, um, gender related um, norms and um, beliefs that women should be in the kitchen fetching water and yeah. mm. those kind of things. So there's time uh, and also acknowledging women participation in, in, in the rural community is very limited mm. and uh, the issues of exposure. Young women, especially from the rural communities, have less exposure to appreciate the, um, the national uh, to, or to also participate in national conversation on women participation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thanks so much, um, Constance, for that. Saki, um, going back to what Constance is talking about, we're looking at young women not being an, a homogeneous group. But let's also look at the intergenerational conversations that are happening. One young person once mentioned that, you know, within parliament we have the elite women that, you know, have sort of created their own club and they're not nurturing young women um, into politics as well. Where is the challenge there? Well, I think intergenerational dialogue is always critical. Mm. You know, uh, there's so much information exchange that can happen. That should benefit both groups, actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that, you know, there's something that, ha that you know, being able to understand the heritage, the challenges, the previous challenges and successes and tools, skills and strategies that maybe someone slightly older has, has got is yeah. useful. But also I think that I think young people bring a wealth of new tools, new skills, new conversations uh, that are in necessary to inform contemporary decision making. And so I think, you know, the, the, the concept of creating, you know, for me, I always think I don't like the word mentorship, mm -hmm. but I think intergenerational dialogue really yeah. gets it to say, how do you have intergenerational dialogue that facilitates for shared knowledge? But I think above and beyond that, you know, in terms of how how do we begin to to, to benefit from you know, the diversity that everybody could bring is also issues around prioritization. Mm. You know, I think if you if, if you talk about prioritization, you know, what I think, what, what I might think is a priority might differ vastly from somebody else's version of a priority. So how do we get to then begin to use skills like negotiation to say, you know, well, these might be the so-called big national priorities, but we've got a priority for this community or this group of, uh, you know, class of persons that really needs to be addressed. So intergenerational dialogue is absolutely critical, but not just in governance spaces, but also in public spaces. Mm -hmm. I notice that in a lot of our public forums, we tend to talk at each other and we are shouting at each other. Uh, we're not actually listening. And, and, and as a result, you find that the hostility, the uncontained hostility, because it's not about whether hostility is okay, happens or not. It's unrestrained. There is no one, you know, we don't have referees. And because we don't have refs in spaces like Twitter, we don't have refs in spaces like Facebook, uh, and those platforms have now walked away from their refereeing duties, we now think that it is okay to have these hostile dialogues. But remember, we want to have progress as a country. Development is not going to happen if we're shouting at each other. So that's when we start talking about additional mechanisms, where we say, how do we begin to have you know, laws or rules that guidelines, for example, in the elections, the code of conduct for political parties, how, but how do we make sure that it is respected? Mm -hmm. Because we want everybody to participate. Yeah. And if we have two people shouting at each other, some, the third person is going to be like, I'm not interested in that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if we have high levels of hate speech on our social forums and it's not being addressed or, you know, people are not penalized for hate speech, you know, we're going to have people who opt out of the conversation. So opting out of the conversation doesn't mean that, you know, you don't want to participate. It means that, you know, we've created a jungle. Yeah. Uh, and, and for me, my, 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 my question is, Yes, women always talk about hostility. Young people talk about hostility. My issue is, what are we doing to ensure that we have a level of playing field? How do we get some refs into the room? If we can do it with soccer, I mean, look at FIFA. FIFA had a huge problem with hooliganism, right? Mm -hmm. There was a huge problem for hooliganism for a long time. But they came up with a system where you find the club, you take points away from the club, the supporters will behave. How about we start bringing those same rules into our politics. Mm. Why We don't care if they, the political parties, we know that that's what they're going to do. Let's start putting some demerits on a, on a party. You will behave better because you want your party to move forward. But we don't have that conversation in Zimbabwe. We think it's okay, Kukandiran. Mm. Just a, 
Okay, Just yes. a quick addition to that. I think uh, intergenerational dialogues can also even assist uh, develop a meaningful mechanism to respond to the unique needs for the developing generation of Ama 2K, right? Because mm -hmm. you realize that as a nation, we have a challenge, um, a social and emerging social challenge mm -hmm. where substance and drug abuse is uh, consuming a large chunk of young people who could meaningfully participate mm -hmm. in these uh, civic processes. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thanks so much, Constance. Well, after the short break, we'll round off this conversation as we ask the key question, is Zimbabwe ready to be led by a woman? And would women vote? for a woman. We'll be right back. Hello and welcome back to the Election Watch program proudly brought to you by the Civio Institute. Today we're talking about women in elections, looking at them um, as voters, as contestants, looking also at the challenges there and the opportunities. And just before the break, we were looking at the quota system, the challenges, inter intergenerational conversations, are they being had amongst uh, the young women and the older generation so that they can be ushered into politics? And right now, we had a key question that most of our panelists are hesitant on answering. Is Zimbabwe ready for a woman president? And are women voting uh, for a woman? We do know that out of our 11 um, presidential candidates, we have one uh, presidential candidate who is a woman, who is Elizabeth uh, Valeria. And I'll throw this one starting with... Grace. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. So I was actually thinking you'd come to me and then I have a story. Mm -hmm. So we were in Mutare and there was a lady that was an aspiring candidate. And during the primary elections, she did everything she could to win. And she was so convinced that before she, before they went to the primary election, she was going to win. Mm -hmm. And she had support. But the result was that she lost and she didn't manage to get into the, the, the race. Right. And then when we're unpacking that, what we realized is, when we're looking at Zimbabwe's readiness for a woman uh, president, it's not about the um, it's not about the the whole aspect of stereotypes. Of course, those are there, yeah. but I think it's about understanding the mind of the electorate, the system that has been put in place around power. What power? do women really have to make decisions? Mm -hmm. And from what we've noticed going around the country in the different provinces, it looks like there's a lot of coercing, there's a lot of bullying, there's a lot of toxicity that then drives women to not vote for their rightful candidate because they're, they're often saying that they're being watched as in how the electoral uh, trends are, are moving. So I think that because, I think uh, Constance spoke about it, because of the patriarchal nature of an election, mm -hmm. right, it's difficult to give a yes and no answer. Right. I think that the country is ready for a woman president. Of course, we are ready. Mm -hmm. We are so ready. But the question is, will we ever have the woman president considering that the system is already rigged against us mm -hmm. as women? So I think we, we are ready. Yes, we are ready. But the way that the elections are carried out, the way that elections play out, the, the, the toxicity, the vote buying, the rigging, the rigging, you know, there's a lot of things that is going on. Yeah. So because of that, I think we might not, I think Saki spoke about it earlier on to say, we were progressing, but right now we are not doing so well in terms of having women as the, as the winners of, of, of the different spaces that they have to lead on. So that, that, that's what I would say for now. Mm -hmm. We are ready for an election, but the system is definitely rigged against women. The system is rigged against women. Saki, your thoughts? Yeah, I think we need to talk about voting patterns. Right. right. I think we need to talk about voting patterns. I think generally in Zimbabwe, our history tells us that our entire society votes for political parties mm. right uh, so and and and, and our, our electoral history tells us that sometimes it is so bad that candidates don't matter the actual individual candidate does not matter it's about the party it's about the party mm. i mean you know one of the things i like doing individually is that i like uh, talking to people when they've come out of you know when everyone's showing their finger i voted i voted i say tell me the names of the people that you voted for 
and you know people will never remember the names they'll be like i voted for this party i mean mm. when they choose to disclose mm -hmm. so so the point then means in this country we don't vote for individuals mm -hmm. we vote for political parties that's what the trends tell us so it becomes very important to talk about what are the political parties putting on the table because clearly the people will not remember even the name of the individual candidate they will remember the party so if we want to transform this country we need to be able to say political parties need to give us a menu that makes sense and i think that's what that's what we're talking about when we look at the numbers mm -hmm. why did political parties i mean you know political parties have their own standards right mm -hmm. according to their own constitutions the ruling party has a 30 percent voluntary party quota zapu has a 45 percent party quota triple c has a commitment for 50 50. never mind that they all pledged to 50 50. Mm -hmm. but none of the political parties that are going to the 2023 elections even met their own internal minimum standard mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what are we talking about here do you know what i mean yeah. why are we even allowing political parties to get tax payers money when political parties receive money from treasury under the political parties finances act that is our money as a country mm -hmm. Why are we allowing political parties that don't meet national requirements to actually receive money? Mm -hmm. Taxpayers' money? Mm -hmm. This is not me as an, an individual donating to a party. Yeah. So my point is, there are things that we can do that can turn this menu around. So the issue is, voting patterns can be influenced by what we design. And the design of the electoral system does not put women at the center. Mm -hmm. The design of the electoral system does not put young people at the center. Yeah. The design of the uh, electoral system does not include persons with disability. Mm -hmm. Let's have a big conversation because we will continue to say the women this, the women that, the but the system clearly, yeah. legally does not think that women matter. Mm. Looking at the voting patterns and, of course, looking at our historical background, looking at elections, what are some of the key issues, uh, constants for female voters in, in this election that political parties must consider? Um, key issues respond to inclusion, right? Right. Um, I would say young mm. women are eager to, to, to be included in electoral processes, mm. right? We have the women's quota system that's designed to emancipate women participation in electoral processes but that lives with its limitations in terms of meaningful then participation of women in po in electoral processes how they then deliver their roles and their res and their responsibilities as the elected um or public office holders so now what we would love to see political parties are responding to the issues of women is to be inclusive uh in, in, is to be inclusive and appreciate diversity in their structure to see women taking up positions, not only through the quota system, but through the contested um, electoral positions. Mm. Can I jump in yeah. on that? Yeah. Mm. I, just thinking about, you know, what you were saying about key issues for the election. Isn't it interesting that it's, you know, we are 20 odd days to uh, the vote and we don't have, you know, the manifestos of the political parties all over the show. Yeah. You know, if you have one party, they have it, but it kind of seems to be like a secret. You can't really get hold of it. You've got another party, it's still coming. Somebody else is like, no, 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 we are launching this weekend. I mean, we want to talk about an election about issues. Mm -hmm. You know, it seems to be an election around personalities and particularly presidents. I think we want, to, we want to be able to say, what are you offering us? Because I, as a woman, I want to understand what political party is going to offer me. What are you going to do fundamentally that has not been done before? That, what does your image of development look like for me? Is it development that's going to make me continue to cook, uh, you know, food using, you know, firewood? Am I going to have electricity? What does development mean for me? So when we talk about key issues, I think it's such a powerful point to say, you know, we're not having the key issues of this election being put on the table. Mm -hmm. w what is on the ballot in terms of, you know, if women are, because clearly when you look at the numbers, women's numbers of women is not on offer. So if it's not going to be the representation, what is the substantive discussion there? Yeah. You know, are we talking about healthcare? Are we talking about, you know, I, I would like to live in a country where people are saying, no, but roads should be, the fight should be, no, but this party is going to deliver roads and this party is going to deliver healthcare. What do we want more? But that doesn't seem to be the conversation we're having. We're having a conversation about individuals. And that's quite, that's not great for the development agenda.
It's mm -hmm. definitely a serious cause for concern, Saki. Um, Grace, uh, just going back to what both Constance and Sakila have talked about, have political parties done enough um, in their campaigns so far to demonstrate uh, that the issues that affect women are being well addressed? Obviously, going back to what Saki was uh, telling us in terms of the manifestos, some of them are being kept as secrets, some of them are still to be launched. I know one political party that you know, made an effort to um, launch their manifesto mm -hmm. recently. Uh, what are the challenges there? So, I don't know, no effort, zero on effort for political, but like a big juicy zero. Mm -hmm. So, I like, I you know, I like what um, Saki is saying. Political parties are not about issues. Mm. There is something wrong with how we're doing elections in Zimbabwe. Because political parties, even if you listen to the rallies, and I've said this to the people, to the parties that I work with to say, why, why are rallies some, some grandiose process of the political party presidents? It's okay to talk about yourself and so on, but that's not what we need right now. In an election, we need to know what you're representing. Mm -hmm. And that's not coming out. Very, I recently had an interaction with the National People's Congress, and I liked their conversation because they were issue-driven. They were telling us, this is what we want to do for the economy, this is what we want to do for the young people. Whether I agreed or not is another level, yeah. but the truth is they were issue-driven. And then you look at the other political parties that are quite major. They're not talking about the issues. So something is wrong. And I... What I think is wrong is they are detached from the reality, lived realities and narratives of the people. So we do know the issues from a, from an overall, you know, over aching birds view narrative. But when we get into the gist of the matter, they don't care about people's lives. They they care about the votes and winning. Yeah. And I think that the way that elections have been done in Zimbabwe, just looking at the history. I don't think people care about the uh, about the issues that affect people, because if Political parties did care. I don't think we'll be having the water crisis. The one that touches me the most because I'm a driver are the roads mm -hmm. and the way now people have to drive and how we're endangering their lives. And w women's issues, hospitals, education, you know, a, a gender responsive kind of social service delivery, that is not happening. So the problem is that I think we lack leadership that actually cares for the electorate and the issues that affect the electorate. And if we could just tweak the way we do elections a little bit and care about the human being. You know, Zimbabwe is all about democracy, but human rights are about the human being. At the core of an election is a human being. And I don't think we care more so for the woman that is a human being. So I think there's a major problem. And there's no Ubuntu, apana Ubuntu, when we look at political parties. So we need to tweak that as Zimbabweans. Mm, yeah. Thanks a lot, Grace. Uh, Asaki, lastly, let's talk a little bit about cases or area of best interest when it comes to a Zimbabwe uh, adopting to increase women's participation in elections or in uh, political processes or in governance processes beyond just being voters or party members. Well, I think the first one, uh, you know, for me as a, as, 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 as a citizen, I'm going to start with my own, to answer this one, what best practices can we have? I think having, you know, people-driven or people-centered approach to, to politics is useful. I think let's, let's start seeing a politics and a governance conversation that talks about the agenda. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's be having fights about, I don't think that that agenda is as progressive as that agenda. So I would start by saying, let's put people back. And I say this because I mean I grew I mean I grew up in the nineties obviously, but I mean my parents used to talk about you know Gutsa Rujinji, mm -hmm. you know uh, you know there was the Rujinji for everything. Now you don't get that sense of for all, you know. There is no education for all. There is no health for all. There is no. So I want to to say the first best practice is to do what we used to do. Let's go back and have substantive conversations about developing this country. I say developing because development is a women's agenda. Mm -hmm. There is no one who benefits more than a woman when we have got progressive development. Mm -hmm. And when there is no development, there is no one who suffers more than a woman mm -hmm. when there is no development. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to agenda-driven politics, right? And let's make the agenda-driven politics be multi party politics, the, the multi-party democracy that our constitution seeks to protect. Yeah. The second one that I want to talk about is our own best practice. Let's go back to, you know, in 2008, 
political parties had voluntary party quotas. And we can talk about how useful they were, how well they were poorly implemented. But we have lost the seriousness of voluntary party quotas because in 2023, we should be talking about turning voluntary party quotas into mandatory party quotas. Mm -hmm. So sometimes as a Zimbabwean, sometimes I get irritated when people show me other countries and they say, look at South mm -hmm. Africa, look at Namibia. And I'm like, yeah, but we were doing that before they were doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been left behind in the dust mm -hmm. on ideas that we started with. Yeah. You know what I mean? Let's go back. Let's reclaim our identity as a best practice. Let's put our best foot forward. And let's show these other countries what we can do. Mm -hmm. But then let's also do something differently. You know, I was reflecting. I saw just this weekend the EFF in South Africa is having um, some kind of anniversary, uh, the 10-year anniversary. And I was reflecting on some of the best practices that political parties have done in the region. Mm -hmm. One of the best practices that happened recently was that the EFF, when it was doing its internal congress, one of their provinces, particularly the Eastern Cape province, sent a list to their national to say, these are the leaders we have chosen in our provincial congress. Mm -hmm. They will be going forward. And the national, you know, the party said no. You don't have any young people and you don't have any young women. We are not going to accept a, provi a province that doesn't have, you know, uh, inclusion. Go back, redo your Congress, come back, Manaka. You know, I don't see a political party in this country, um, you know, doing that. Secondly, look at the, 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 the rule in the ANC about, you know, they have a one-third quota. Mm -hmm. And look at the fact that the fight right now is to make sure that the top six in the party has got meets the one the one third uh, quota so that's South Africa but you can look at Senegal Senegal actually changed the electoral law to deliver on 50 50 yeah. on their constituencies uh, you know you can look at South Africa even in local government we've created an additional quota mm -hmm. of women in local government but South Africa has embedded mm -hmm. that quota mm -hmm. in their existing because we took that council of an award and it mm -hmm. and we want these cancer if we have got one one thousand 970 wards for this election. Let's make sure that half of them are men, half of them are women. How hard is it, Nai Nai? We've yeah. done it before. Yeah. So, and we've, I mean, we're doing it with Senate. We, so, we have done it before. Let's have a proper conversation that's progressive to say, I would rather have a conversation of how do we do it yeah. rather than should we be doing it? Yeah. Let's go back to, to, to best practicing based on what we know. And if we come up with something new, wouldn't we love it? I mean, people like to say, oh, look at Rwanda. Yeah, Rwanda. But wouldn't we want people coming to do study visits to Zimbabwe? <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. So I think, you know, there are things that we can do. And I think, so my, my first point is, let's be the best Zimbabweans that we can be. Let's do this. We've, we know what's wrong with our electoral framework. We know what's wrong with our public political financing framework. We know what we can do. Let's take homegrown solutions and let's make them amazing. And let's be the country that gets spotlighted for doing something phenomenal. Mm. Well, thank you to all our panelists. We had Sakile Sifilani, who's from, from the Women in Politics Support Unit, Grace Chirenja, who's a gender equality and social inclusions consultant, and Constance Maseko from the Youth Empowerment and Transformation Trust. As we were talking a little bit about women's inclusion in elections and politics, looking from a voter's angle and, of course, a contestant uh, angle, ch looking at the challenges and the opportunities there and how we can move forward as a country. Thank you to everyone who joined us for this conversation, and we'll see you all in the next program.